Crystal's smile captivated everyone, and no one adores her more than her best friend, Bronze Beckley. You and Crystal McDowell, you were close. You were like sisters. I guess we met when we were about 17. Her spirit was just radiant, and it affected people. It affected strangers. It, it drew you to her. But she gave her heart to the man who would become her husband, Stephen McDowell. Braun says at first it was a match made in heaven, but quickly turned into hell. They got married in April, and by December they were separated. Just within months? Mm -hmm. So the good times, they didn't they last? They didn't last, yeah. But they reconciled really fast because the baby was born, you know, about a year later. First a boy, then a girl. And we want to give you a big kiss too, ready? One, two, three. Mm -hmm. Mwah. Mwah. Braun says the initial growing pains of a young marriage melted away. I mean, they had a great life. They took family vacations together, always on Facebook, loving each other, posting that the, how much they loved each other. They were loving, and he was very kind and sweet and loving towards us. And I mean, it just looked like the perfect little family. But a month later, that ring would be off her finger. Crystal and Stephen divorced. Well, what happened? What started to go wrong? I don't know. Whatever reason she decided to divorce Steve, um, I don't know what that reason was, so. She kept her relationship business private? Probably to the public and probably maybe to some of her closest friends because she didn't want us to worry. Crystal's new townhouse was undergoing a remodel, so she remained in the family home with her ex. Braun says Crystal told her it was becoming difficult. She was a little worried. Um, he had gotten a little possessive, maybe, because he probably thought, okay, we are kind of coexisting. Maybe there is hope for reconciliation. And so when the new boyfriend came into the picture, then that hope is gone. The new boyfriend, a well-known jeweler in town, Paul Hargrave. Uh, we met in my store. She came in to have a, a ring remade. It was her grandmother's ring. She was a, a beautiful person inside and out. She's unlike anyone I've ever met. Paul says their relationship heated up quicker than summer in Texas. You love Crystal. We were very close, yeah. So close that Crystal and Paul exchanged adorable love notes on text message. I've seriously never been happier. I love you. Had you talked about marriage? Um, we tentatively talked about a few things, but again, this relationship was, was fairly new. We were talking about possibly our moving in. Um, she didn't want to be by herself. Paul says Crystal didn't want to give her ex too much information because Stephen may not be too happy that they were dating. She didn't want him to know uh, much at all, I guess due to the fact of, of his reaction and um, what he would say or do. He would probably learn about Paul soon enough. Stephen and Crystal were set to go on a cruise with the kids and her uncle. But Paul says at the last minute, Crystal disinvited Stephen and asked him to go on the cruise. But she wanted you to go and brought you a ticket, and then she was going to tell him he wasn't going at all. That's correct. I don't think they were getting along well at that time, and I think she was um, ready to, to get out of the house. Then an unwanted guest crashed into their house, Hurricane Harvey. The storm was approaching. How did she wake up? What did Crystal plan to do? She woke up fairly early that morning. She was going to go pick up her kids. And then she had scheduled some sales appointments later that day. Paul's surveillance cameras captured these images of Crystal leaving his house in the morning and getting into her black Mercedes. She left here around 7 in the morning. She probably arrived at Stephen's house 20, 30 minutes later. At 727, Crystal texts Paul, have an amazing day and you are so sweet. He texts back, I love you and I'll always support you. I began to get worried after she didn't start replying back to my text messages. Um, Crystal was known to reply back very quickly. Paul frantically texts that evening, 
I'm so worried about you. I hope you're okay. He never saw her again. Crystal just flew into the hot, humid air of a hurricane and vanished. Gorgeous real estate agent Crystal McDowell is missing. Hours before Hurricane Harvey bears down on Baytown, Texas. Did anybody think that Crystal may have just been trying to flee the storm? It just didn't make sense for a well-to-do woman like this who by all counts loved her kids to just disappear. When Crystal's best friend, Bronze Beckley, learned she was missing, she went into full panic mode. I told my husband, I said, I feel something's not right. At first, Bronze worried, could Crystal have been kidnapped while showing a house? She is a real estate agent, and so that thought crossed her mind, but she didn't show up for her appointments that day. And so that was off the table. Bronze, who lives several hours away in Mississippi, tried to drive to Baytown to help in the search, but Harvey just wouldn't let her. Did you feel that she may have fallen victim to the storm, to no, Hurricane no, Harvey? Uh -uh. And neither did Chambers County Sheriff Brian Hawthorne. Hurricane Harvey is about to hit the city, wreaking havoc. How did you know that this had nothing to do with the hurricane? Well, we pretty well knew it had nothing to do with the hurricane because the missing person uh, complaint had come in prior to the storm. Where do you even begin with a missing person's report looking for a young mother when a storm is approaching? Nowadays, one of the first things that we look at is uh, social media. So we immediately pinged her telephone and we started doing other things such as getting search warrants on her phone records. We could not find her iPad, we couldn't find her telephone, so we were operating off of her phone records. One number would pop up a lot. Crystal's new boyfriend, Paul Hargrave. What did he tell you? Was he cooperative? Um, he was cooperative and fairly forthcoming. But we had problems getting some evidentiary items from him, such as video. He claimed he had video, so obviously that became a uh, red flag to us why somebody wouldn't be turning stuff over to the organization that was tasked in trying to find and locate her. I immediately went to the police department and gave them a statement, um, DNA, cell phone records, camera footage. I wanted to try to get them as much information as possible so that either they could A, rule me out, or B, focus on someone else that may have had something to do with this. Did you take a polygraph test? Yes, ma'am. What were the results? They didn't tell me the results, um, but there was a, yeah, a lot of yelling and, and screaming, and it wasn't a good experience for me. So I don't know if I passed or failed. They didn't really state. Then the sheriff talked to Crystal's ex-husband, Stephen. What did he tell you about her disappearance? About any He pretty well just had told us that he hadn't seen her, that she never showed up at his house. Wait a minute. Remember? Didn't Paul say Crystal told him she was going to Stephen's house to pick up the kids? Detectives now put Stephen on the polygraph machine. How did he do in the polygraph? He, he did fail the polygraph. So he lied. Well, he wasn't forthcoming on all those uh, questions that we had in the initial uh, interviews with him. But a failed polygraph doesn't prove guilt, and it doesn't reveal what happened to Crystal. At this point, are both men persons of interest? Yes, at this point, yes. Two persons of interest, Paul, the boyfriend, the last man known to have seen Crystal alive, and Stephen, the ex-husband, who denied seeing her the day she disappeared. You know and love Crystal. What did you think? I felt Steve had done something. From the start, you suspected I, Steve. Yes, mm -hmm. Was it if he can't have her, no, no one... one can? And I think that's when the new boyfriend came into the picture because he had only been in the picture a month. He knew he didn't have a chance anymore. Mm -mm. She was gone. Right. She was gone, for real. But where? Investigators are about to make a pair of shocking discoveries. See this black car right here? This Mercedes? Two people got out of it and it doesn't belong to them. In the flooded parking lot of a cheap motel, Crystal's Mercedes is found abandoned. This home video shot from the motel balcony exclusively on Crime Watch Daily. They have a white car right up there. 
that was waiting for them to come and now they're getting busted. They should be going to jail, but why is she in handcuffs? Those two people rummaging around the car are quickly ruled out as suspects. Inside the car, the sheriff finds something very suspicious. That obviously told us that uh, she or someone had placed the car there. And it, the way the car was parked, it appeared to us it was uh, more staged. We didn't think for a moment that, that Crystal had parked it. Why? What leads you to believe it was staged? This was a 2013 Mercedes. You would not normally see that in a Motel 6 parking lot with the keys left in it and the doors unlocked. Then, 11 days later... I got a call from the uh, Texas Ranger that Saturday afternoon um, saying um, that they had found him. A horrifying discovery. Crystal's decomposing body dumped in this wooded area, an area that was forecast to be covered by millions of gallons of water from the hurricane. He led us to the body. He actually, you know, drove us to the body. Who did? Who took them to Crystal's body? It was Crystal's husband, Stephen. He says he killed her. How did he take her life? It was by strangulation. He choked the life out of her. That is correct. In their home where she was staying with him. Correct. The sheriff says McDowell tearfully confessed, reportedly telling them he strangled Crystal in the living room with the children in the room next door. I think they know daddy hurt mommy and mommy's not coming back. McDowell was charged with first degree felony murder. He's held on $500,000 bail. He hasn't yet entered a plea, and the prosecutor is expected to deliver the case to the grand jury. When you found out that her ex-husband, Stephen, had confessed to killing her, how did that hit you? Um, I was devastated. I was, um, doesn't feel like reality. Doesn't feel like she's, uh, she's actually gone. And so uh, it's, it's been difficult to, to come to that realization. What would you say to Stephen? I have no words for Stephen. Crystal had a long-lasting impact on Baytown. Her loved ones will never forget her. What's the hardest part now that you go through in, in missing her? Is knowing that I'm not going to get a text again. I'm not going to get a call again. We're not going to do birthday parties for our children again. I won't get over, I mean, this will be a long time before I'll get over losing her. The McDowell's two children are now living with a family friend out of state. And fortunately, despite rumors spread online, the sheriff says there is no evidence the five and eight year olds saw or heard their mother killed. Steve McDowell is being held on a $500,000 bond. He has yet to enter an official plea. Right now, I want to bring in our legal contributor, Jesse Weber. Jesse, thanks for being here. Thank you. What happens next? He's been charged. Yes, a grand jury has formally indicted him. Criminal charges have been brought against him, murder charges. And let's not forget, this is the state of Texas. He can not only face life without the possibility of parole, he can face capital punishment, a death sentence here. He confessed and took investigators to the body. Right, which is, begs the question, why hasn't he entered a guilty plea Why yet? is that? Just because someone confesses doesn't mean it's the end game. They could cite the fact that maybe this confession was coerced. Maybe he's going to say that there was more events leading up to her death that we don't know about. He could try and say there was a struggle, that it was an accident of some sort. His defense team is working hard, and they obviously have to, because when you have a defendant who has confessed into police and shown them the body, it is a very uphill battle. It seems like this is an open and shut case either way, either a plea or a conviction. You know, it, you might think it is, but there's always defense attorneys out there. They have a lot of room. And there's been reports that there's been problems in the investigation. And if the defense can pick up on the fact that perhaps there's been an investigation that was tainted or tampered in some way, that is ample opportunity for a defense attorney to strike and say, what evidence do you have here? And this is not the right way that you should have gotten it. The sheriff says that a private investigator hired by the family meddled in the investigation. Oh, the defense is definitely going to attack that point because whenever you have a problem in the actual investigation or the gathering of evidence, that's what the defense is going to attack. They're going to attack the state's case. Now, if this goes to trial, that might be great grounds for them. But at the end of the day, when you have a confession and the man who led authorities to her body and confessed to strangling her, it can seem like an open and shut case. Attorney Jesse Weber, thank you as always for being here on Crime Watch Daily.